Well, good evening, Yellow parents, guardians, Christine Burton, superintendent of schools. So I want to thank you uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, for the first of a series. Um, for a series of speaking as part of our district's efforts towards strengthening our partnerships and our communications with our school community. Um, before we begin uh, with our speaker, I do want to share just a few brief announcements for upcoming events for the year. Um, you may have seen in our last board meeting the board approved the projects that will be included as part of the referendum vote. Uh, happening later this fall, November 7th. Uh, it will help to address additional capital and maintenance projects, one of which is the high school auditorium. Earlier today, at our staff convocation, we were at the high school auditorium and I mentioned to the staff that they couldn't hear me or they couldn't see me as well, uh, but they were, we were hoping that those renovations would help make that facility a much better environment for all of our facilities. Of and I do know that we've had students, uh, our young students, as well as our high school students that use that facility. This auditorium, if you look around, um, has been renovated to its original rendering. So it is a beautiful example about how the renovations and what it can do to help beautify our schools. Uh, there will also be projects for each of our schools as well. So mark your calendars November 7th. There will be many more opportunities to learn about the details of the referendum and the projects within the uh, upcoming weeks at PTO meetings, board meetings, flyers, handouts, so much more. But you heard it here first. Uh, later for the referendum vote later in November. Be also on the lookout for opportunities to be part of one Milburn event. And this is part and parcel of two some of those uh, events. So you may be asking, so how is this one Milburn I've been hearing about? It really is a, a coming together of the school district, uh, the township committee, houses of worship, chamber of commerce, really to work together towards diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging. This is the work really of the entire village, if you will, not just the school. Uh, I'll be honest again, what was started as adversity, we are building towards a greater opportunity. Um, for the entire Melbourne community. But help with an engaging and inspiring message with today and this evening um, to build on the themes of belonging, uh, share strategies to support your students, and perhaps even how to think differently from a different perspective about uh, how you see your students. We saw the help of speaker and author, David Dahl. Uh, during the last 20 years, Dr. Rendell has spoken to audiences across the globe. Prior to becoming a certified speaking professional, he was a leadership professor and stand up comedian. He also managed nonprofit enterprises that provided employment for people with disabilities. David has a doctorate of a management degree in organizational leadership, as well as a graduate degree in psychology and the author of four books leadership and the many facets of his work with students. Would you please help me welcome David Jindal? All right, so I get to speak to parents a lot, and it reminds me of the story. The first speech I ever gave before I was a professional speaker, uh, a friend of mine from high school uh, was a pastor at a church, and his wife was running this summer seminar series for women, and uh, she said, hey, would you come speak about parenting to this group of mothers and grandmothers? Um, and I was like, oh, Probably not, uh, because I don't have any kids, um, and I would be the only man in the room telling these women how to take care of their children, so I think I'll pass on that opportunity. Um, she says, no, 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 I have this great introduction for you. Just come out, do the presentation. I promise it will go great. So remember, she's married to a guy that I was friends with in high school. So she tells them about my complete lack of qualifications to speak to them. I think I had my master's degree at that point or something, but I had no children at the time. And um, she says, uh, but the reason you should listen to Dave is because Dave is proof that even your really bad kids can turn out okay, right? <laughs> um, and so I want you to hear me from all of those perspectives. So 
Um, I know this stuff I'm telling you is true because it's my life, right? And we'll talk about that. Um, I'm also a parent and I've used this. I've also used this with a lot of parents. It's helped me in my relationship um, with my wife. It's probably one of the reasons she still is my wife. Um, but also, you know, I have been a college professor. I am a professional speaker. But um, I think that's really the lesson. My parents didn't think I'd be up here. My parents didn't think I was going to be okay. Um, and yet the very things they thought were going to keep me from being successful are exactly the things uh, that made me uh, successful. So that's a little background um, on that. So the first thing people want to know when they meet me is how tall are you? Um, the answer to that is I'm six foot six, but I'm six nine in heels. And uh, one of the problems with growing up tall and growing up poor, I grew up in a trailer park in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, is uh, when you grow up tall and you grow up poor, you grow up faster than your family's ability to buy you pants. Um, so I always had high water pants or floods, they called them, and the kids would tease me and make fun of me, hurt my feelings. And my mom knew they were hurting my feelings. She wanted me to feel better. And so she lied to me and told me they were capri pants and that they were coming back in style. And that turned out not to be true. Um, I'm six foot six. My wife of 28 years is just five foot three. Um, if you wonder how that works, a lot of people are like, you're so tall, she's so small. How does that work? I tell people that in our relationship, deodorant is much more important than breath mints. <laughs> uh, so, uh, wife and I, we've been married for 28 years, and we have three daughters. They're 21, 19, and 16. Uh, those are weird names, but we really like them. And um, I've always been the outsider at our house, right? I'm the only guy at the house. Even the dog's a girl. The dog is a Bichon Frise Princess Snowbell. Um, and even if it wasn't, Bichon Frise is a girl dog, uh, even if it's a guy. Uh, <laughs> so I'm the only one who is a man at the house. And my message tonight is really simple, that we transform lives when we find strength where everyone else sees weakness, right? We transform lives when we find strength where everyone else sees weakness. One of the easiest things to do with our children is to see what's wrong instead of what's right. Um, one of the easiest things to do with our spouse or our partner is to see what's wrong instead of what's right. One of the easiest things to do with ourselves sometimes is to see what's wrong instead of what's right. And what I want to challenge you to do tonight is to find strength in your kids, in yourselves, where everyone else sees weakness and maybe even where you currently see weakness. Also, to take a little bit higher level, you know, what we're trying to do tonight is simply help you be better parents and help your kids to be better kids, right? And to grow up to be successful adults. What I'd like to do is maybe change your definition of what a successful adult looks like, right? What a successful adult looks like, because there's a lot of different ways to be successful, and sometimes, especially when our kids are younger, we have a very narrow idea uh, of what success looks like, so I'm hoping to broaden that um, for you tonight. So I want to do two things. I want to try to change our belief system a little bit about how do we get better, how do we help other people get better, and then I want to talk about how do we change the way we treat people, how do we change our behaviors after we change our beliefs. So the first part of this is to do what I call awaken, to see that everything we've learned about weakness is wrong. And why am I talking about weaknesses when we're talking about getting better? Because the most popular way uh, to get better is to find what's wrong and fix it, to find weaknesses and try to fix it, right? Um, and I want to give you a completely different way um, to do that today. And by the way, let, let, let's, let's do this for a second. So um, there's something called negativity bias. Has anybody ever heard of negativity bias? Negativity bias says we tend to see what's wrong instead of what's right in any situation, even if what's wrong is really, really small and what's right is really, really big. So I had to draw, I, I spoke to the Milburn teachers this morning, K through 12, right? And then I drove down to Waterford, New Jersey, all the way down south, you know, halfway out to Vineland and spoke to some teachers there. And then I drove all the way back. So that means I had my meal, at, uh, you know, from McDonald's while I was driving in the car today. And so imagine I spilt just a big, puddle of sauce, you know, on my shirt. Uh, what negativity bias says is if I had a big stain on my shirt up here, everybody in the room would be staring at that, th that stain and seeing that, thinking negative things about me as a human being, because I can't keep, keep myself clean. Um, or we'd all be thinking about the fact that somebody's using a reciprocating saw on the stage while I'm doing a presentation. So, and, what it also means is that some of you wouldn't even be able to pay attention to the presentation at all, right? It'd be like the stain was talking to you the whole evening, right? And no matter how positive and how encouraging you are, there's nobody in this room who would be looking at a big stain on my shirt and thinking, that Dave Reynolds doing a good job. Because 98% of that shirt is stain-free. Nice job, Dave. Nice job, right? 
You know, like that's marketing, that's subjectivity, that's spin control, but it's not. It's a measurable objective scientific reality. 98% of the shirt is stain free, but we only notice the 2% the stain, and in school, a 98% gets you an A+, plus. and yet if I was, uh, if you were asked to rate my appearance at the end of the evening, and I had a big stain on my shirt the whole time, most of you wouldn't just give me a failing score, you'd give me a zero, because we're not supposed to have stains on our shirt, right? You might think, okay, well, that's kind of an abstract example, so let's make it personal to school and to parenting. If your kid brings home a report card, and it's all A's and one C, what are you going to talk to your kid about that night? What are you going to talk about? You're going to talk about the C, right? You're going to try to help them work on the C. You're going to schedule the time to talk to the teacher about the C. You're going to give them extra um, activities related to the C. You might give them a coaching related to the C. You might send them to some terrible summer camp in the subject related to the C, right? This poor kid's going to do nothing but try to make that better. And what does that mean we're missing, right? What that means we're missing is all those A's, right? What about all those A's? Why are we not seeing all of those things? And that's what we've been taught, is that that's what you want to focus on. That's what you want to fix. That's what you want to improve. That's what you want to do better. And again, I want to give you a different way to look at that tonight. So I was always in trouble at school. That's part of the Dave is proof that your bad kids can turn out okay. I was in trouble for three things. I couldn't sit still, be quiet, or do what I was told. Um, that means the teachers didn't like me very much. They called me obnoxious, rebellious. People are looking at each other, nudging each other. So you either have children like that or that's your partner. Um, so teachers called me obnoxious, rebellious, inappropriate, immature, told me I had no self-discipline and no self-control. And if I couldn't fix those things, I was going to end up homeless and living in a van down by the river. Right? Now, what those teachers didn't know is that in 2023, if you lived in a van down by the river, that was the pinnacle of success in American life, right? Hashtag van life, you got a sponsor, and you're on Instagram. So. But they were worried about me, right? And the teachers were frustrated with me, so they would send me to the principal's office. I remember I was in third grade, so I was eight years old. I got sent to the principal's office. He sat me down on his lap, which seems questionable now, looking back on it. Uh, and he told me a story about three kinds of bad people. And I'm like, wow, this story doesn't even have good people in it. And he told me there's bad people, there's really bad people, and there's people who are too far gone, they'll never be good again, right? I was eight. And he told me I was really bad and I was on the verge of being too far gone if I could learn to sit still, be quiet, and do what I was told. So let's talk about intentions for a second. Because I think he had the right intentions. He wanted to help me. But his parents, his teachers, and his employers had taught him a framework, which is we need to find people's weaknesses and fix them. We need to find what's wrong and we need to repair it in order to create success. He had the right intentions, but as I want to show you tonight, he had the wrong Framework. Now, I'm not the only one who had trouble in school. Ken Robinson says many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think you're not. Because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. Many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. And this doesn't just happen at school, by the way. We're not picking on schools at a school. At home, my parents called me motor mouth in a well-intentioned attempt to remind me that my biggest problem was my inability to be quiet. They had the right intentions, they loved me, but what they were concerned about was my inability to be quiet. And they thought if they could fix my weaknesses, their parents, their teachers, their employers had taught them that if they could fix my weaknesses, that would help me be successful. If they couldn't fix my weaknesses, I wasn't going to be successful. Many highly talented, really creative people think they're not because the thing they were good at, their strength, right, wasn't valued, it was ignored or denied, or it was actually stigmatized every day at home, at school, at work. We tell people that their biggest strengths are actually weaknesses. And I know this is true because that's exactly what happened to me. Because as, a, as an adult, I became a professional speaker. On Monday and Tuesday, I was doing, I was an MC um, for an event in Chicago. I flew in very late um, last night. I did a presentation this morning, drove all the way down, did another presentation this afternoon. I speak for a living. My entire job is doing presentations in front of people all over the world. I've spoken on every continent except Antarctica. The penguins don't have a lot of events. Right? I get paid to do the thing that everyone in my life who cared about me spent their entire life trying to prevent me from doing. A couple of years ago, I bought my parents a house with the money that I make as a professional speaker, and they don't call me motor mouth anymore. Do they, right? They're like, we always knew of all our kids, Dave was the one. Dave was the one who was going to make it, and we knew he was the one who would take care of us in our old age, right? 
And if you ask them, they'd be the most surprised that now when I post a video of me or, or pictures of me doing my presentation, my mom will get on Facebook and be like, what a blessing that you get to share your gifts with the world. Right? She wasn't calling them gifts when I was a kid, right? She was just swinging wildly at me in the car trying to get a piece to, to punish me for the fact that I couldn't be quiet. As an adult, I'm paid to stand up, not to sit down. I'm paid to talk and not to be quiet. And I'm paid to run my own business, not to do what other people tell me to do. I turned out to be successful, but not in a way my parents could have anticipated, right? And by doing the very things that they dedicated their entire life to stopping me from doing. Because they were worried that those were exactly the things that were going to prevent me from being successful, when those were exactly the things that made me successful. And so that's what I want to do today. I don't want to just change your perspective just a little bit. I want you to see things that you formerly thought were terrible, bad, awful, or something to be changed, and realize that there's probably something incredibly valuable hiding inside of that, or probably not hiding. It's probably fairly obvious once you understand the concept. So my parents didn't see it. My teachers didn't see it. My employers didn't see it. But finally, when I was a sophomore in college, someone changed my life. One person changed my life in about 15 seconds. I was walking down the hallway, I was a sophomore in college, and I was just about done with my second year of school, and it was almost time for summer break, and I was walking down the hallway, and the resident director, Elliot Anderson of the men's dorm, walked up to me in the hallway, and I thought I was in trouble. He said, Dave, are you going to apply to be a resident assistant? And I said, no, I'm not, because I am the reason you have resident assistants. <laughs> right? And he said, no, 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 David, he changed my life with one sentence. He said, when I look at you... I see myself in you, and I see what everyone else sees as weaknesses as leadership skills. And I would like you to be on our team. He was the first person who told Everybody else said I had potential. I just had to change everything about who I was. I had to sit still, be quiet, and do what I was told. And then, and this is the key thing, right? People are like, oh, yeah, no, I believe in my kids' potential. They just need to totally transform everything about who they are, and then they'll find And that's how he said it. He said he saw that who I already was was valuable in and of itself. Does that make sense? And that the very things that everyone else was trying to change about me, he saw it differently. And that was the first time I thought it was possible to be successful. Because to be clear, when everyone in my life told me I was going to be a failure, I just believed them, right? I wasn't one of those kids who were like, I'm going to show you. I was like, ooh, this is, this is disappointing, right? It's disappointing to find out I'm going to be a loser for the rest of my life. But I believed them. Disappointing, because I tried, by the way. I didn't, I didn't say, oh, I'm just going to keep being noisy, and I'm going to keep moving around, and I'm, I'm going to deliberately. No, I was trying to fit in and do the kinds of things they wanted me to do, and I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. So one person, right, one person transformed my life by finding strength where everyone else saw weakness. And I know sometimes this can seem abstract. You can be like, okay, Dave, that's cute. That's your story, but that isn't everybody's story. So I have all sorts of examples that I think you'll enjoy and hopefully find interesting. So this kid's name is Joe Whale. Has anybody heard of Joe Whale before? He's also known as Doodle Boy. Um, so Joe Whale lives in the United Kingdom. He lives over in England, I believe. Um, and he loves to doodle. You can see it back here. He doesn't just kind of like it. Um, and he's not just scribbling. He's drawing unique little pictures over and over and over again. And when he was in school, He'd get a notebook and he'd fill up page one and he'd flip it over and he'd fill in the back and he'd flip to the next page and he'd fill in and he'd just sit there and doodle and doodle and doodle and doodle. Well, this did not make his teachers happy because you're supposed to be taking science notes, you're supposed to be taking math notes, you're supposed to be taking literature notes. And so one of his teachers sat him down and they said, Joe, you have to stop it. You have to pay attention in class. You have to stop with this stupid doodling. It's never going to get you anywhere. That was teacher number one. Fortunately for Joe, he had a different teacher, and his other teacher said, hey, Joe, I think that's really cool, um, and I'm going to set up an Instagram account for you, and we're going to see if anybody's interested in your doodling. Um, and it turned out that at least 165,000 people uh, were interested in Joe's doodling, and a local restaurant noticed uh, Joe's doodling, and they made him a deal. They said, Joe, we'd like to hire you, and what we're going to do is we're going to paint the walls of the inside of our restaurant completely white, and we would like to pay you over a series of months, um, and maybe it'll take a year, to doodle 
uh, on the walls and fill up the entire wall uh, with your doodles, and that's what he did, and that's where he's standing right there. So little Joe went from getting in trouble at school with one of his teachers to having another teacher create an Instagram account, and now he's hired to be an artist and have his work featured at a local restaurant, and he's making money. And I don't know if you've had that experience yet with your kids, but when kids make money, it's awesome because that's money you don't have to give them, right? <laughs> so every dollar your child makes is a dollar you made. When my daughter started babysitting at 13, she's like, I made some money. And I'm like, well, actually, I did. She's like, you're going to take it. And I'm like, no, I just don't need to give you as much because now you have your own, right? So Joe's already making money, but the story gets better. So he starts doing his doodles, but then everybody finds out about the restaurant, and then people start posting about that like crazy. And then somebody says, hey, would you like to do a gallery show just like any other artist? And would you like to sell your art to the public? Because we think that people would really like um, your art. So Joe starts making uh, full-size uh, art and selling it to people at gallery shows. This guy comes along. Might be a little too much of a fan. I'd keep an eye out for something like that. You spend a lot of time with your kids. Um, but he's a big fan. He's even copying Joe's hairstyle. Um, but he's helping Joe um, sell his art. Um, and turn it into a business. So now Joe, and look, Joe's loving it. Joe's doing great, uh, and he's making money. I don't know what the prices are there, but he's doing good. Uh, then it gets better. They say, hey, Joe, do you want to do a coloring book? And he does, because doodles are perfect for coloring, because they're black and white, and you can fill them in real good. And then he starts um, illustrating um, children's books, and now he's getting paid to be an illustrator, and he's putting his art out there in the world and selling it at the Scholastic Book Fair. Um, and then Nike calls. And Nike says, Joe, would you like to make custom Doodle Boy shoes um, for Nike? And so now you can buy Joe Whale's shoes on Nike.com, right? Can we agree that Joe is successful? Can we agree on that? Can we agree that Joe is not successful in any of the way most people plan for their kids to be successful, does that make sense, right? And some of you are disappointed in your children now uh, because they're not um, already having a deal with Nike at age 15, right? <laughs> But when you walked in, all you wanted them to do was get decent grades and go to a good college and maybe get a decent job someday. Does that make sense? So one teacher says, Joe, you've got to stop. The other teacher says, Joe, let's turn up the volume. And that's my whole message today. If you can see the strength hiding inside the weakness, then you can give the child the opportunity to pursue something you otherwise would have restricted them from doing. And maybe that's their opportunity to find success and maybe in a way that we didn't originally anticipate. Because I tell this story to teachers, and there's a lesson in there for teachers, but there's also a lesson in there for parents, because his parents didn't have to let him do all this stuff, did they? When he's doodling on the walls of that restaurant, what is he not doing? He's not doing his homework. He's not doing his studies. He's not focused on getting straight A's. He doesn't. He couldn't possibly have time to focus on all of his schoolwork while he's doing all of these other things. What they had to decide is this is valuable enough to make some of those other goals a little lower of a priority. Does that make sense? His parents had to be involved in this process. And if they said, no, 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 Joe, that's not how to be successful. We need you to make sure to focus on, right? But they didn't, right? Because they saw that this is something special about Joe, and that this thing that everybody saw as a distraction from what was really important was actually a very, very valuable thing. So we transform lives and we find strength for everyone else sees weakness. So the next step is to assess ourselves and assess other people, because if we don't know the strengths and we don't know the weaknesses, uh, we can't use those things. So Parker Palmer says, we led the truth by our weaknesses as well as our strengths. So what I want to show you today is, like I said, every weakness has a corresponding strength. So we can actually use people's weaknesses to lead us to, to teach us what their strengths are, right? So we're going to practice because I know this feels a little bit outrageous. Some guys up here telling you your kids' weaknesses are strengths. And like, so I guarantee you, if you came to my house, you would not believe that. Okay? So I've had that experience. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you a story about my youngest daughter's weaknesses. Her name's Sophia. I'm only going to tell you about her weaknesses. And when I'm done, I want you to raise your hand, and I want you to tell me what her strengths are when I've only told you what her weaknesses are. Does that make sense as an activity? So I'm going to tell you a story about weaknesses. You tell me um, about her strengths. So. I think it's mostly parents in here, but how many of you have kids? Raise your hand if you have kids. Okay. If your kids aren't here, how many of you have at least one difficult kid? Don't do it if they're right there. Don't do it if they're right there, right? How many of you have a kid who's so difficult if you would have had them first, you wouldn't have had four kids? You know what I'm talking about, right? You would have just stopped the experiment. You're like, no, we're not good at this. Right? So that's what happened with Sophia. Sophia's our third, and how many kids do I have? 
three right we had her we're like we're not good at this anymore right we it's irresponsible for us to continue producing children at this level of quality and putting them out into the world and so we shut the factory down right we shut the factory down uh, and so one of the things about Sophia, she's difficult, right? What do I mean by that? She looked my wife in the eye in the eye when she was four years old, and she said, I hate you, and I wish I had another family. Mm -hmm. I was not prepared for that. Right? I was like, well, okay, well, I guess we appreciate your openness and uh, sharing uh, how you're feeling with us, and I guess in the spirit of transparency, we should let you know we can feel the same way about you. <laughs> we didn't know. We could say that out loud. We thought we had to push that down and drown in alcohol, but I guess we're just talking about stuff, right? So, so she's difficult. One of the things that makes her difficult, she's a liar, right? She's chronically dishonest. So I'm going to tell you a story of my favorite lie that she ever told, and that's how you know someone's a liar if you have a ranked list of favorites, right? <laughs> so we send her to kindergarten, first day of kindergarten. The teacher says, bring a snack and a lunch. And so she brings a snack and a lunch, and she brings a bottle of water, and she brings some Ritz crackers and a Ziploc bag. And she's ready for snack time. Snack time rolls around. She gets out her snack. Um, the other kids get out her snack. But some kids don't get out of snack. Some kids forgot. Their parents forgot. It's the first day of school. Don't worry about them. They're not, they're not struggling financially. You know, everybody in the school has plenty of money. They just forgot their snack, right? Their parents forgot. They, they were busy in the first day of school. But the teacher, she is a professional, and she was ready. So she goes over to her desk, and she gets some cookies and some juice, and she starts handing out the cookies and juice to the kids who didn't have a snack. I don't know if you remember what it's like to be five, but cookies and juice is the thing, right? Cookies and juice is the thing. And so Sophia looks at this, and she is not pleased, right? She's like, this is some bullcrap right here. I'm over here with crackers and water, basically prison rations, and these delinquents over here are getting cookies and juice, right? I want cookies and juice. So she raises her hand on the first day of school, a teacher calls on her, she says, what can I do for you, Sophia? And she goes, well, I forgot to tell you earlier, I'm actually allergic to water. Right? <laughs> Sophia sold all her credibility on day one of school for some cookies and some juice, right? So Sophia's difficult, that's a weakness. Sophia's a liar, that's a weakness. So I told you about her weaknesses. Raise your hand if you heard any strengths while I was telling you about her weaknesses. Go ahead, your hand went up fast. Uh, bold, adventurous. Oh, I, I love it, bold. And, I, well, she's got a whole, like, now we are still looking for a family for Sophia, so <laughs> let's talk. This lady's into it, this lady's into it. She can even drive now, it's fine. It's basically hardly doing anything. Right. Let's pay for the gas. Okay, go ahead in the red jacket, yeah. Very creative, all right? So we've got bold and creative. Go ahead, over here. Yeah, she figured out, right? She's a problem solver, right? She figured out a solution very quickly to get what she wants. She just had to pretend to be allergic to something that you can't be allergic to or else you would die very quickly. She will never make it. Right? Oh, by the way, this is how bold Sophia is. I told her that you can't be allergic to water. That was a stupid lie. Um, and she's bold, so she looked it up and she's like, you can't. You can be allergic to water, it's called hydrophobia. And you can be allergic to ingesting it, but you can be allergic to having it on your skin. And there are people who cannot get wet, um, or else they have tremendous problems and they have to wash themselves in ways that does not include water. So she's like, see, so shut up. <laughs> and I'm better than you. Um, so she's still at it, right? So she's bold, creative, she's a problem solver. Anybody else here any strengths? Well, go ahead in the back there. Uh, she's a negotiator. She's a negotiator. Yeah, I like that. She's a hostage negotiator. She's a hostage taker, and then she negotiates based on the messages she's taking. Go ahead. She's outspoken. Yeah. Say that again. Yeah, she's not afraid. Now think about this. And some of you, some of you know, right? Because you've had kids. There are some kids who will not speak the whole year in a classroom. Even if called upon, even if called upon nicely, they're not going to say they'll go a whole year and not speak to an adult. She called on the teacher. On the first day, she's like, hey, over here. Yeah, we're doing this. Okay. Listen up. Okay, we need to talk about something. She called on the teacher. Now, here's one thing. This is important to remember. Um, when we see our kids' characteristics, sometimes we don't like it because it's happening to us. But if they did it to somebody else, we'd be proud of them. Does that make sense? So when your kid says, Mom, can I have a sleepover? And you say no and they say, please, and you say no, and they say, but maybe, and you say no, and they say, but I'd really like to, and you say, stop it, and they say, but could we really? And you say, please shut up right now, 
much. And then they say, but I really want to. You say, I don't want to hurt you, but I pray. But when that happens, right, you would call them being stubborn, and you'd say, I wish my kid wasn't so stubborn. If that same kid was trying to get a summer job, and they called an employer, and they said no, and then they called them back, and they said no, and then they showed up in person, and they said, and they fought for it, and finally the employer said, yes, what would you do? You bragged all your friends. My kid's so persistent. <laughs> they went after what they wanted. They were bold, and they took care of this, and I'm so proud of them. What's the difference between persistence and stubbornness? And the answer is, who is it happening to? Okay? So one of the things that, that we're taught as parents is that we have to change some of these characteristics about our children. First of all, we can't do that. I don't have time to get into that, although I'll mention it in a second because that might seem wild to say. But we're not going to change those things anyway. Right? But the other problem is if we changed it, we would be making them worse, not better. Because that characteristic is very, very positive. If you stopped your kid's stubbornness, you stopped their persistence. Persistence is sticking with things longer than most people think is reasonable. What is stubbornness? Sticking with things longer than most people think is reasonable. You know when we respect stubbornness? We call it persistence once the person has succeeded. Until they've succeeded, we call it stubbornness, and it's a problem that needs to be solved. Afterwards, we're like, nice job. I was with you the whole time. <laughs> and you weren't with them the whole time because persistence is sticking with things longer than most people think is reasonable. Right? So here's what's interesting about what just happened. You positively, quickly, and accurately described my daughter, positively, quickly, and accurately described my daughter when I only gave you negative information. And that's the power of what we're talking about here today. This isn't rose-colored glasses. This isn't pretending that the weakness doesn't exist. It's just making sure that you at least know that there's an upside here that you're probably missing and that has value, has tremendous value in that person's life. So we transform lives and we find strength for everyone else. Sees weakness. So the next step is to accept it instead of trying to change it and instead of trying to fix it. So a good way to think about this is side effects. There's no such thing as a medicine without side effects. And if we want the benefits that a medicine provides, we have to be willing to accept the side effects. If you won't accept the side effects, you don't get the benefits. I was speaking re recently to some oncology <coughs> pharmacists. These are the people who deal with the very powerful and very deadly cancer drugs that people take when they're battling cancer. What are some of the most harmful side effects in any category of drugs in the world? And the answer is cancer treatment. And those things have the power to destroy your body. They also have the power to save your life. And what I'm telling you today is there's no such thing as a person without side effects. There's no such thing as a student without side effects. There's no such thing as a child without side effects. There's no such thing as a spouse or a partner without side effects. And if we live in a world going, I want to wait for a perfect one, or I'm going to create a perfect one, or I'm not going to be happy until it's a perfect one, that never happens. It's about acknowledging and accepting that every strength has a corresponding weakness, every weakness has a corresponding strength. Peter Drucker said it this way, he said, strong people always have strong weaknesses too, where there are peaks, there are valleys. Strong people always have strong weaknesses too, where there are peaks, there are valleys. So we transform lives and we find strength where everyone else Sees weakness, right? But now it's time to appreciate it. Right? Now it's time to we can't accept it if we don't agree, or we can't appreciate it if we don't accept it, right? But appreciation is a higher level than acceptance. So George Eliot said every limit is a beginning as well as an ending. So I want to show you the beginnings that come with the limits that we have. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about limits because what some motivational speakers love to do is they like to say there's no limits. Um, I do Ironman triathlons. I even have the logo on my body, so I'm a big believer. Uh, but I, I hate their slogan, this, and nothing is impossible. Right? Nothing is impossible. Yeah, plenty of things are impossible. Right? So many things are impossible. It's a stupid thing to say that nothing is possible. An Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and a 26.2 mile run. Completing one is amazing. It's not impossible. But completing one in five and a half minutes is impossible. Right? Completing a swim without touching the water is impossible. Right? Running, but there's so many things in the world that are impossible, and something's more concrete, right? When people see how tall I am, what's the second question I get after how tall are you? What's the next question after how tall are you? What do people ask me? Did you play basketball? Right? And what I ask them is, did you play mini golf? Right? Did you play little league? <laughs> Were you the shortstop, right? Like we do? No, I don't do that because I'm not me. Why do they ask me that? Because height is an advantage in basketball. What they're saying is, did you take advantage of the advantage that you 
10. It's perfect. Even a little kid will ask me, did you play basketball? Little kids are smart enough to know that you should take advantage of the advantage that you have. But imagine I told them, no, I didn't. I didn't play basketball. Don't stereotype me. I wanted to be a jockey and ride a horse to victory in the Kentucky Derby. That was my dream. That's a stupid dream. But we live in a world where we don't like to tell people that that's possible to have stupid dreams. And then we have these movies like Rudy where we cheer people on when they, when they try to achieve things that they can't achieve and they're not designed for and they ultimately fail and then they make a movie about them. And it's a terrible lesson, right? It's impossible for me to be a world-class jockey because world-class jockeys are this tall. My legs may weigh more than a world-class jockey. There are some things you can't do. And so we need to understand that, but every limit is a beginning as well as an ending. It teaches us what we can't do so we can move towards what we can do, what we're designed for. Right? So one of, the, this, uh, one of the, uh, the limits that we have is dyslexia. Right? If someone has dyslexia, they struggle to read and struggle to write, and if you struggle to read and struggle to write, you're going to struggle in school, and we've all been taught that if you struggle in school, you'll struggle in life. Which is why they were really surprised when they were studying millionaires in the United Kingdom and they discovered that 50% of the millionaires in their study had dyslexia, even though only 10% of people in the general population have dyslexia. They were studying entrepreneurs in the United States, people who started their own businesses, and 35% of the entrepreneurs had dyslexia, even though only 10% of people in the general population had dyslexia. Ingvar Kamprad, the billionaire founder of IKEA, the world's largest and most profitable furniture company, has dyslexia, right? He's also responsible for 67.4% of the world's divorces. Um, so this is Richard Branson. He's the billionaire founder of the Virgin series of companies. He has dyslexia. And what some people think when I tell them this is they're like, yeah, Dave. And his parents helped him and his teachers helped him and they probably got some tutors to help him. And then he overcame his dyslexia and then he became Successful, and that's not the story. They asked Richard Branson how his dyslexia affected your success, and he said, strangely, I think my dyslexia has helped. Right? He specifically says that he's not better in spite of his dyslexia, he's better because of his dyslexia. And scientists are starting to back this up. Their research is showing that people with dyslexia don't have broken brains, they have different brains. And the same brain that causes them to struggle in school causes them to succeed in real life at a higher level than most other people ever will. This guy's name is Paul Orpola. He has dyslexia and ADHD. And let me stop for a second and talk about why I talk about actual diagnosable disabilities. Because one of the things that's easy to do when I tell Sophia's story or tell my story is to say, okay, you had some moderate weaknesses and there's some kind of moderate strength on the other side. I get it but you don't understand who I'm dealing with. They have major weaknesses, and I don't think there's any strength in that. Does that make sense? And so that's why I use diagnosable disabilities, because if a diagnosable disability has an upside, then whatever weakness that you think, some character flaw you think somebody has, there's definitely an upside for that. If something way worse has an upside, then something in the middle has an upside as well. Right? But then Paul Orville is taking it to a new level. He has two disabilities. He has ADHD and dyslexia, and so he gets kicked out of four schools. And then when he tries to get jobs, he gets fired on the first day. And so then he finally gives up and he goes to work for a family-owned business and his own dad fires him from the family-owned business. He can't work at the family-owned business. So he starts his own business. He builds it into a multinational corporation that makes copies. He calls it Kinko's and he sells it to FedEx for $2.4 billion. And then he said this, he said, I think everyone should have dyslexia, right? The subtitle of this book is How a Hyperactive Dyslexic Built a Billion Dollar Corporation. When they asked him if we could give you a pill that would cure your dyslexia, cure your disability, take away this harmful thing that's been destroying your life, he said, absolutely not. Because when you fix my weakness, you would destroy my strength. When you take away the disadvantage, you take away the advantage. His argument is that he's better because he has ADHD and dyslexia, and those cause him to run his business in a way that made him more successful than somebody who did it the conventional way. 
We transform lives when we find strength for everyone else sees weakness. A friend of mine is a middle school principal, and he started sharing these billionaire stories with parents when they would find out that their children had dyslexia because they would feel like it was a death sentence and that they were hearing that their child was never going to have any level of success at all. It was probably going to live with them for the rest of their lives. And by the time they got done listening to this, they had some hope. They saw a different future for their child than they had before because they found out that that weakness has a corresponding strength. So how would we treat our kids differently? How would we treat each other differently? How would we live our own lives differently if this was true? The first thing we'd do is we'd give our children permission to turn up the volume on who they were instead of trying to get them to turn it down. Permission to do more instead of doing less, right? We love to talk about moderating, reducing, or eliminating behaviors, right? You just need less of that. You just need to control it. You just need to hold it down. You just need to dial it back. You just need to... We're almost never talking about turning it up. So that sounds ridiculous, so let's give you an example. So Jimmy Kimmel's a late-night talk show host. He's a comedian. He has his own television show. He's one of the highest-paid comedians in the entire world. And years ago, he was asked to host the White House Correspondence Dinner, Black Tie Affair, lots of famous and successful people there. And at one point, he leans into the podium, he seems to be getting really serious, he says, I just want to thank Mr. Mills, my 10th grade history teacher, who told me I would never amount to anything if I didn't stop screwing around. Uh, Mr. Mills, I'm about to high-five the President of the United States of America. And then he did, putting this woman in the most awkward picture of all time. <laughs> And then he came back to the podium and said, eat it, Mills, right? Now, let's talk about what Mr. Mills said. <gasps> Mr. Mills said, you'll never amount to anything. That's rough. My parents gave me hope. They said, you'll never amount to much. Right? <laughs> he said, you'll never amount to anything unless you stop screwing around. Now, remember, Mr. Mills had the right intentions, but as I'm trying to show you, he had the wrong framework, because he told Jimmy, you'll never amount to anything unless you'll stop screwing around. So let's think for a second. How did Jimmy Kimmel become one of the most famous and successful comedians in the world? By doing what? By going pro at screwing around, by going full time at screwing around, by becoming more childish, more ridiculous, more silly, and more immature. Now, again, this is one of those things. If you're a serious, professional, formal, adult person, and you don't enjoy silly, ridiculous, and immature, it's easy for you to tell somebody like, Jimmy, that's never gonna work out for you. What you're saying is, I don't like it, so it's bad. Instead of being able to say, I don't like it, but that doesn't mean it's bad. I don't like it when you're doing it to me, but I'm sure I got kicked out of art class one time when I was in eighth grade, and the teacher said, I think we're all tired of listening to you. And as I'm walking out of class, the other kids took a vote, and they're like, actually, we are not tired of listening to him. And we bring him back. And then that teacher hated me even more than she did. At the what she was saying is, I don't like it, and what she put you in, that's a fine thing to say. And that's a fine thing to say to your kid. I don't like it when you do that. I don't appreciate when you do that. I don't like it when you do that around me. What we like to do is turn it into this universal generalization about their character, and it's not true. Can we give people permission to do more of something, even when it's something that we don't like or that we don't enjoy? And that's a hard thing to do sometimes. But he went successful because he turned up the volume on all of those characteristics that Mr. Mills told him to turn up. This guy's name is Jason Hewlett. When he was in school, he was out of control. But finally, one of his teachers handled it a little differently. Instead of telling him to stop it, he made a deal with Jason. And he said, Jason, if you want to put on a show, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach for the first 50 minutes, but you can do your show for the last five minutes in front of the class, and you can try to get better at being a professional entertainer. Jason went on to become a professional entertainer, doing songs and impressions uh, in Las Vegas, and then became a professional keynote speaker, and he travels around the world, and he makes fifteen dollars to $20,000 a presentation doing the things that one of his teachers said, you know what, let's give you a shot. There's nothing wrong with you, you just need an opportunity to hone your craft, and I'm going to let you do it here, even though this isn't necessarily the place for it. Someone gave him permission to turn up the volume, right? Now, this is easy to do, by the way. You just have to realize that the criticism you have for your child, there's actually a place for it. So how many of you ever heard the phrase, save your drama for your mama? You ever heard that, right? Save the drama for your mama? Okay, so what you're saying is stop being so dramatic. This is an easy question to ask. In the place we're in, so take a second here. If you have a kid who's too dramatic, where do you send them? It's called drama class, right? 
And then they get on stage and they perform in dramas. And it's a good thing to be dramatic. Right? You have a hyperactive kid. You send them to sporting events. You send them to sports practice. No coach has ever sent the kid home from sports. And they're like, oh my gosh, your kid will not stop running and running and running. How can we help people turn up the volume? We transform lives and we find strength where everybody else finds weakness. And if we see the strength, we're going to want to foster that and develop that and help that person turn up the volume on that. But we have to have, find the right fit. Right? And too often we're trying to help people fit in instead of helping them find the right fit. So what do I mean by that? So I was a kid um, and I delivered newspapers at 5 o'clock uh, every morning. And one uh, morning I fell off my bike and I broke my left arm in half. The lower part of my forearm came up at a 90 degree angle to the rest of my forearm. They didn't want to do surgery because I was so young, and so they put, on, put me in traction, and they set the bones manually, and they put me in a cast up to my shoulder for three months. After three months, they took me out of the cast. They told me I was good, um, and I moved on with my life. I played basketball, I played baseball, I played cross country and golf, and I had a scholarship to college for basketball, so I did play basketball. I know you're wondering how I did. I've never been able to do that jockey thing. Uh, so, I thought I was fine until I was 20 years old and my friend Carl was playing the guitar one night in our dorm. And I said, Carl, show me how to play the guitar. Um, and he tried and he failed. And he thought I was stupid and I thought I was stupid because I couldn't play the guitar. And then we realized they put me back together wrong at the hospital when I was 12. So what you should be able to do is called supination, which is where you put your palm flat to the ceiling, and pronation, where you put your palm flat to the floor. Supination. Pronation. Um, and I can do pronation with my left arm, with the one that I broke in half, but I cannot do supination at all. And the reason I couldn't play the guitar is because to play the guitar, you have to turn your hand inside out, and I can't turn my hand over at all. And it was in that moment I realized why I had struggled at the drive through for so many years. I thought we were all struggling at the drive through but it turns out it's just me, because I can give them the money just fine. Then they go to give me the change, and I'm like, oh, right. and they're like, sir, you need to turn your hand over. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, but you also have to reach it out. I'm like, I was reaching it out. Right? My sister-in-law had a great idea for me. She said, I need a basket on a stick. and just put it in there. Right? But it gets worse, because in 2009, I got hit by a truck that was going 50 miles an hour while I was training for a marathon, and he hit me in my left elbow, same arm. And this time, he sheared off my left elbow. So this time they took two gigantic screws and they screwed them through my left elbow and that's what holds my left elbow together. And even with physical therapy, I'll never be able to extend my left arm fully again for the rest of my life. And so I'm tall, we've talked about that, but I'm tall in the sense that a Tyrannosaurus Rex is tall, right? I don't have the wingspan that you would expect from a person of my height, right? Now, sometimes I get to travel to exotic places like Milburn, New Jersey, um, and other times I go to more mundane places like Sydney, Australia. And one of the interesting things that happens in Australia is that they drive on the left-hand side of the road, and so they drive on the right-hand side of the car. How many of you ever driven in the left side country? Anybody been? Yeah, lots of them. Awesome. Yeah. So does anybody know the first place that I drove when I drove in Australia for the first time? The drive through you bet I did, because I wanted to know what it felt like to reach my right arm out the window. Oh, so good, right? I was asking for extra ketchups and sauces. I think you forgot the napkins. I need a fork. I was just bringing that stuff in like a boss, right? Now, why do I tell that story? Because when I'm in America, I'm disabled and damaged in two different ways. And I function terribly in the American drive-through. Also, oh, I'm so happy you have the easy pass up here now. We just have to do the toll change. Oh my gosh, I was worthless. If you need a toll change, just follow me and all the drop change, I can't get it. <laughs> so I'm disabled and damaged in two different ways. And so I function terribly in the American drive-through. And then I go to Australia and I function perfectly in the Australian drive-through. I haven't changed who I am, I've changed where I am. I haven't changed the person, I've changed the place. And if you don't hear anything else from me tonight, the way you help your kids be successful is you find the match between who they are and where they are. 
Most of the time, what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the person. We're not trying to find the right match between who they are and where they are. We're trying to change the person to be a good person, whatever that means. We have certain definitions of good, and we're trying to move them closer to that. Instead of saying, given who they are, what is the place that allows them to maximize that? Because situations are powerful. And they can either put the spotlight on the best things about you, or they can put the spotlight on the worst things about you. And the problem is when the situation has the spotlight on the worst thing about something, we're convinced there's something wrong with that person. Instead of stepping back and saying there's just a bad fit between who they are and where they are. It's a perfect situation here because I have actual spotlights on me. Because I had a teacher in school, and she'd call me out for being disruptive, and she'd say, Dave, I guess you just want to be the center of attention, don't you? And what I want to do is invite her to something like this and be like, ta-da! <laughs> right? She talked about it as a criticism. Instead of saying, Dave, if you'd like to be the center of attention, maybe you should seek out situations where you can be rewarded for being the center of attention. My job for the last two days in Chicago was to be the MC at an event. If you're the MC at an event, what is your job? It's to get the audience's attention. They need to know what time the buses leave for the dinner. What time are we coming back from break? Who's coming up next? Who's coming on stage? What's happening? And if I can't get their attention, then I can't be successful in my communication. I'm a keynote speaker. It's my job to get and keep people's attention. The person presented as the worst possible characteristic that you could have that you wanted to be the center of attention, instead of saying there are, there are careers where you can be the center of attention. Right? So there's this kid named Clint, and he's at school, and he's one of those kids who's constantly tapping his leg, his leg's constantly moving, he's constantly tapping his pen on the desk, he's constantly making noise, and he's constantly moving, and that makes the teachers upset, and he's constantly getting in trouble with his teachers. And one day he thinks he's in trouble again and his teacher says, I want you to stay after class. And he stays after class and he's dreading the punishment that's gonna come, what's gonna happen, I'm gonna stay after school, am I gonna get suspended, am I gonna get yelled at, what's gonna happen? And his teacher walks up to him and he says, I want you to know that you're not a problem, you're a drummer. And he handed the kid two drumsticks. Now this isn't the band teacher, by the way, this is just the teacher. This is a teacher who saw strength where everyone else saw weakness and didn't just see strength, but saw a place where he could use that strength. And he handed Clint a couple of drumsticks. Clint did join the band. He did become a drummer. Then he came in third on America's Got Talent. Have you ever heard of that show? He came in third on America's Got Talent. And then he became a professional speaker and he uses his drums on stage as he communicates to people about how to have effective lives and run effective businesses. One person, saw strength where everyone else saw weakness and transformed Clint's life because they saw something that no one else saw and they framed a future for him that he didn't know was possible for himself, right? So last example, and this is a perfect parenting example and I use this with everyone even when it's not a parenting talk, but there was this guy in Denmark, and his name was Thorkil Son, and he had a son with autism. Two of the symptoms of autism are hyper-focus and doing the same thing over and over again. I want to pause for a second. Um, anytime somebody says your kid, or anytime you feel like your kid is hyper-doing something, I'd like you to ask a simple question, which is, who decides? Who decides? Someone's hyperactive. What's the right level of activity? Your kid is hyper-focused. What's the right amount of focus? Does that make sense? And the reality is there's no answer to that question. I have a master's degree in counseling psychology. I understand how the DSM-5 works. I understand how we diagnose people. I have a doctorate in management leadership. I've taken classes and tests and measurements. There are no blood tests for any of those things. There are no objective ways to prove any of these things. The only thing that makes something too much or too little is what does the situation demand? What does the situation demand? When I finished my first Ironman, people praised me and rewarded me for 17 hours of nonstop physical activity, for swimming 2.4 miles, biking 112 miles, running 26.2 miles. They praised me and rewarded me for being very, very, very active. When I was a kid in school and I was very, very, very active, what did people say? You're hyperactive, you have ADHD, and you need medicine to fix it. 
I got criticized and punished for being very, very, very active. I want you to stay with me for a second. Then I got even more active, and people said, wow, that's amazing. I could never do that. Good job. So anyway, his kid has autism, hyper-focused, doing the same thing over and over again. So he's trying to be a good dad. He's got his kid in treatment, so he stops hyper-focusing and doing the same things over and over again. But then he goes to work and he notices that in software testing, in his business, in software testing, he notices they need employees who can hyper-focus and do the same thing over and over again. And he notices that normal, normal employees aren't very good at hyper-focusing and doing the same thing over and over again. And he has an idea and he starts a business called Specialist Learning. He's a specialist in Danish. And he hires his son and 49 other people with autism to do software testing for his business. They become so successful that the global software company SAP starts hiring hundreds of people with autism from all over the world to do software testing for them. They stop trying to fix the weakness and they built on the strength. He didn't change who his son was, he changed where his son was. He didn't change the person, he changed the place. And a diagnosable disability became a competitive advantage when he helped his son find the right spot. And he didn't even help his son find the right spot, he created the right spot. One of the things that I'm the proudest of, and I said this at the beginning, I'm a parent, so I'm telling you that this works as a parent. I'm also telling you this works as a person who lived this and wishes someone would have told me sooner. But one thing I can tell you, your parents, one thing I can tell you that I'm proudest of, I have a 21 year old, she's about to finish her master's degree. She went to one kind of school from K through 12 and then went to a college. She did a dual enrollment program where she took community college classes while she was in high school, which enabled her to finish sooner. That was her path. Her younger sister went to the same school through eighth grade and said, I'd like to be homeschooled. I'm like, I have no interest in teaching you. That's what teachers are for. We found this online homeschool curriculum. She was already very organized and, and responsible. Uh, we signed her up with an online uh, university that had a high school program, um, and she did um, ninth through 12th grade. She did all of her program online at her desk in our house. Um, she got a two-year college degree while she was in high school uh, going through that program. She got an associate's degree, and she's about to graduate from college. Um, later on this semester. My um, youngest daughter went to the same school through eighth grade and then we sent her to a college prep school um, that she'll be at um, for the next two years and she's already been there for two years. I have three daughters. How many schools did they go to? They went to three schools. Why? Because every time the question was what's the best fit for that person? What's the right fit for them? There's no such thing as a good school. I'm up here. I'm a successful person. I won't talk about income and all those kinds of things, right? But I could if I needed to. But the place I have my degrees from are not impressive. I went to a small a religious school that only had 400 people when I went there because I could get a basketball scholarship there, right? So I went to a small private school that's one of the lowest ranked probably schools in America. Right? Then for my master's degree, in the evening while working full time, I got my master's degree from a state school, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, before they had programs sort of designed for adults that were convenient. And I did that while I worked full time. Also, the butt of sitcom jokes and things like that, going to night school and doing all that kind of stuff. Then I got my doctorate with University of Phoenix Online. If you just Google jokes about University of Phoenix Online, nothing I did was prestigious. Nothing I did was amazing, but every time it fit the life that I had and the goals that I was trying to accomplish. Nobody else from the outside would recognize it, but it was valuable for me because it was the right fit for me. How can we help our kids find the right fit? And if we can't find the right fit, will we have the courage to create the right fit for our child instead of saying, this is just the way the world is, and if you can't be what they need you to be, I don't know what to do for you because this is the way the world works. And I know that's a difficult challenge sometimes, but also I put my money where my mouth is because that college prep school is not inexpensive. And even if you're not doing private, you're living here and paying the property taxes, so you're paying for your kids' education. We transform lives and we find strength where everyone else finds weakness. Right? So let's wrap it up. This is a leaning tower of Pisa. Right? If you're not sure what's wrong with it, it's leaning. It's in the name. Right? It's been leaning since 1173. It's been leaning for 850 years. And in the 1930s, Mussolini decided this was a national embarrassment instead of a national treasure. And he ordered his government engineers to straighten it up. 
and they tried, and they failed. And that was a really lucky thing for the city of Pisa, wasn't it? Because millions of people have traveled millions of miles and spent millions of dollars to see a tower that leans. And if you don't believe me, tell me what this building is called. <laughs> <laughs> this building is beautiful, look at it. It's very, very old, and it's not falling down. <laughs> and no one cares. <laughs> you can Google image search Leaning Tower of Pisa right now and it'll look like this is in a field all by itself instead of almost touching another building at its base. We crop this out like a bad ex-boyfriend in pictures because what the world wants is this and yet what we all try to build is this. We try to build communities like this, and schools like this, and families like this, and people like this, and what the world wants is this. Based on how much some of you have traveled, all the left-hand side countries, people raise their hand. You know if you've traveled at all, the universal sign for an Italian restaurant is what? Right? You see that, you're like, they got pizza. Right? You see that, you're like, they got spaghetti. This, is, this could be the Italian flag. And yet somebody was like, you know what, we've got to fix it because it's broken. It's not broken. People like it the way it is. They value it the way it is. And so the people who run the tower finally figured it out. And this is the way I want you to think about your children. This is the way I want to think about your relationships. Think about your businesses. This applies to so many things, right? What they say now is because of its inclination, the tower has become the object of very special attention. The people are now trying to keep it this way. Because of its inclination, the tower is going to be to very special attention. What I'm telling you is if you want your children, you want your relationships, you want your work, you want your business to be the object of very special attention, it's going to be because of the inclination. They go on to say that it's important to keep the current tilt due to the vital role this element played in promoting the tourism industry of Pisa. The tilt is vital. Your kid's tilt is vital. We used to have a word for that. We used to call it their vent, that your kid had a vent. We used to think that kids came out a certain way and that we wanted to direct them in that way that fit the person that they were. And then at some point we decided, we'll just turn kids into whatever we want to turn kids into and that doesn't work. And even if it worked, it's not necessary. We think our job as adults, as parents, as leaders is to straighten people up and straighten people out. And it's not. It's to help them preserve that tilt. So I use this quote from E.E. E. Cummings. This kind of sums up my mission in life. He said, we do not believe in ourselves until someone reveals that deep inside of us something is valuable, worth listening to, worthy of our trust, sacred to our touch. I wrote a kid's book because even when I'm not talking to parents, almost all my audiences have parents in them. When I'm talking to business leaders, when I'm talking to teachers, when I'm talking to business owners, when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, and they always want to talk to me about their kids afterwards. So finally I wrote a book called The Free Factor for Kids so that a little kid could understand the concepts and see the idea and hear the story. And so this lady named Stacy bought the book at one of my presentations and she took it home to her son Leo. And Leo was 10 years old and he had ADHD. And she gave him the book and he read it and he wrote a note and she brought it back to me and it said, Thank you, Mr. Rendell, for the book. It made me feel better about who I am. Because I was the first person who told Leo that deep inside of him something was valuable, the very thing, his ADHD, that he'd been told was the most worthless thing about him. That it wasn't worthless, that it was valuable, worth listening to, worthy of our trust, sacred to our touch. Because we transform lives when we find strength where everyone else finds weakness. Thank you very much. And we had the opportunity to see uh, uh, Dave in a previous engagement and said we need to bring him to our district. So again, with our staff uh, earlier today, uh, and thank you again this evening for seeing him. Bring him one more round of applause for Dave. <laughs> thank you all for coming out this evening. Appreciate it.